a little bit of background. I'm Watsal Joshi. Um, I'm a PhD student at University of Texas at Arlington. And uh, over the last one year, I've been working on developing a custom flight controller board um, with, with a new microcontroller that, that PX4 does not support. And so my talk today is mostly about how do you go about designing your own custom flight controller board, right? Um, and my goal today is to summarize the whole process that I went through and give you like a quick start guide so that you don't have to work as hard as I did. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, just as a background, PX4 def uh, defines the, uh, all the flight control boards into two categories, mostly. Uh, one is the PIXOX standard autopilots, which are all the PIXOX that uh, we all use. The other ones are manufacturer-supported autopilots. The difference is uh, PIXOX standard autopilots are officially supported by PX4. Right, they are designed in collaboration with PX4, while the manufacturer-supported autopilots are designed by different manufacturers like Model AI, uh, Cube Orange, and uh, other such companies, and they put uh, software support for those autopilots uh, or those boards inside PIXOC or PX4, I should say. Um, and the common uh, features that you will find on these boards is a very nice powerful microcontroller maybe running at 400 megahertz maybe a little bit more uh, it has bunch of communication protocols and it has multiple sensors on board for the redundancy purposes and and for the development purposes these boards are amazing they they can do almost everything that you can ever ask for and the complete list of boards is available on the PX4 Autopilot GitHub repository at boards folder. Uh, now, some of the boards here are, as I said, the PX4 that you can see right there, all of those are PIXOC boards. Uh, others are developed by different manufacturers. Some are even uh, experimental uh, stages and so on and so forth. So not maybe not all the boards work in today's time. Some, most of them will definitely. Now, going ahead, uh, why would you like to do a custom board for whatever work you are doing? Um, let's say one of the examples could be form factor. What is the size of the board? Uh, how much does it weigh? You may want to optimize for your specific drone design. And, however, many of the existing board do cover a lot of these categories, right? We can, we can have a PIXOC 5X, which is big. It, it weighs a good amount, but then we can have something like a uh, Airmind Racer, for example, which is extremely small and very lightweight, right? So that exists. Uh, that's the, the, so this should not be the reason for you to design a custom board. Well, what about the sensor set? All of these boards do also come with great amount of sensor set. You always have a bunch of IMUs, barometers, uh, some of them also have magnetometers on board, so that should not also be the reason. Um, what about cost? Well, cost also ranges from very low, as low as, uh, let's say, $75 for Omnibus F4SD, and we can go as high as $429 for uh, CUAV boards. Um, so we have a very wide range there as well. Um, a more recent issue could be the availability of the boards because of the ship chip shortage, right? And so that can be one of the reasons. But all in all, none of these on their own are the reasons. It's generally the combination of all of these, right? Let's say you are in a research setting and where you want have where you have a specific size restrictions, you have weight restrictions, and then you want to put bunch of sensors on board. Uh, you might be also designing your own custom product, uh, which can run PX4, and in that case, you might want to design your own custom board, right? So these are the reasons. A combination of these are the reasons that can be. Uh, used to come up with a custom board. Now, where do you even start to design a custom board? From my perspective, one of the very nice starting point is the existing PX4 uh, PixHawk standard. 
it defines uh, which microcontroller is used, what are the sensors that are used on board. It also defines a complete pinout uh, for the microcontroller, which pin is connected to what sensor, what its function is, everything. So that's a very good starting point and you can start there. Uh, you can also take a look at uh, connector standard and bus standard. Uh, connector standard defines what kind of connectors we use. So uh, that can be used for interoperability with like, for example, GPS. GPS use uh, JST connectors uh, for today's PixHawks, right? So you can, uh, you can look for that in the connector standard. And then we have bus uh, standard. So for example, for PixHawk 5X, you have a base board and then you have the actual uh, autopilot board, right? Which is the smaller cube on top of the base board. And in that case, you will have to use uh, a bus standard to uh, make them work properly. So that's a good starting point. Um, once you have a nice idea on what sensors you want to use, what communication protocols you want on board and everything, then you can uh, uh, make a nice little list of what exact requirements are. How many UART ports, how many I2C, how many SPI, whether you want it for quadcopter or maybe a fixed wing. Depending on that, the number of PWM uh, outputs will change. So you can come up with a minimal set of requirements uh, that you have to satisfy. Anything extra is always good, right? And then finally, you figure out what microcontroller you want to use. Um, PX4 right now supports uh, STM32 and NXP very widely. Almost every microcontroller, almost every capable microcontroller from these companies are supported by PX4. Uh, Raspberry Pi has a new microcontroller which, for which I added the support over last one year. And if you are courageous enough, you can add support for more microcontrollers from other companies, right? Microchip, analog devices, or maybe TI. They have some uh, good microcontrollers. Um, so let's take an example, right? This is the micro, uh, flight controller board that I wanted to design. I call it OpenFC2040. These were my requirements. I have four PWM outputs for quadcopter. I needed two UARs for telemetry and GPS. I needed two SPI for IMU and micro SD. I needed I2C port for magnetometer, right? And I needed uh, some GPIOs for, you know, uh, LEDs, uh, arming button, or uh, buzzer, things like that. So based on these requirements, I chose Raspberry Pi's uh, RP2040. Now, if you compare the my requirements with what is available on the microcontroller, it is a very close match, right? I, I, ha I need two UARs, it has two UARs. I need two SPI, it has two SPI. Right, I need one I square C, it has two I square C's. So it's a very nice match and it's a, it's a very nice fit. And this allows me to, you know, utilize almost everything that is available on the microcontroller. Nothing more, nothing less. And so if you want to do this kind of optimization, you can always go ahead with it. And, uh, you know, that will allow you to make a very nice, concise little package. Uh, one of the very important steps that you should do whenever you pick your own microcontroller is to come up with what is on the left hand side of the image. Well, from my from your perspective, it's on the right hand side. Sorry. <laughs> so on the right hand side, what you can see is all the GPIOs that the microcontroller has, and I have mapped each and every GPIO with its function, whatever sensor it is connected to, what it is going to do, everything like that. And why it is necessary is because not every GPIO can have each and every function on it. Right, some of the uh, GPIO may uh, produce PWM, but they cannot work with I2C, for example. You cannot configure every GPIO for every peripheral with every microcontroller. So this part is kind of critical if you want to really optimize and take advantage of our, everything that is available. Okay, uh, so going forward, let's talk about how to uh, go from that idea on the paper, we have mapped all the GPIOs, we have the uh, microcontroller chosen. How do we go from there to actually designing a flight controller? And I like to uh, divide the complete circuit into a bunch of subsystems. Uh, the first system is uh, subsystem is power supply and USB. So 
uh, this figure is divided into two parts on the top left yes on the top left you have uh, a voltage regulator right it's it's a little bit inefficient if you want to uh, you know run for my case for example the voltage input is 5 volts but then my controller works at 3.3 volts so it's sometimes inefficient if you want more efficiency you can always go with switch mode power supply um, on the right hand side there is usb bus or usb port you can use type c or micro usb and generally you will have two resistors connected to d plus and d minus uh, pins of the usb port and that is generally necessary if you look at uh, top right you see there is a usb detect thing now there are certain nuances which are very specific to uh, px4 programming part of things the code part of things and uh, uh, px4 code has this uh, feature where it can it wants to detect whether the usb is connected or not and so this voltage divider part will allow it to do that right but so that's uh, for the power supply what you may need next is decoupling capacitors these are very very necessary for whatever IC you may use. Uh, what you are seeing here is specifically for the microcontroller, but each and every IC, almost every IC that you use on the board will need decoupling capacitors. The use of decoupling capacitors is to filter out um, voltage fluctuations, right? If your voltage is not consistent, if it's going up and down, these act kind of as a low pass filter and it, it flats, uh, flattens out the voltage a little bit. Uh, specifically for the microcontroller, every microcontroller has this VDD pins spread out all around its uh, periphery or if you have the other kind of package, it will be all around on the surface, right? And every VDD port generally takes one or two decoupling capacitors, right? So your decoupling capacitor will go around the mi uh, microcontroller. Next thing is, and this is the part which is a little bit non-deterministic right um, because this part is in uh, involves uh, a little bit of trial and error so every microcontroller needs a clock signal it uh, how much frequency should it be it uh, it will be defined in the hardware design guide for that microcontroller uh, for my specific case i needed 12 megahertz uh, crystal oscillator right and whenever you go uh, find that crystal os oscillator with that specific frequency, you will also find these three values in the data sheet. You have the lower capacitance, uh, equivalent series resistance, and the maximum power that crystal can handle, right? And these three values will allow you to define or find out the value for the two capacitors C16 and 15 uh, that should go around that uh, crystal and uh, it will allow you to find out the value of R7, which is a small resistor. And R7 is used to uh, make sure that your crystal does not have too much power on it, too much current passing through it, otherwise it will, it will die soon, right? And so the equations that you see down there are the ones that you can use to find out these values. Now, the, big, the unpredictability part is the CS, which is called uh, straight capacitance. And, the, and this capacitance value is never perfectly known. It depends on the exact circuit that you have. It, def it depends on how long the traces are and things like that. So generally people go with uh, a guess value of five picofarads, but as I said, it's unpredictable. So you may have to do some tests. So generally what people do is you put the crystal you put the a variable resistor like a potentiometer or something like that and then you play with it a little bit but that's the way to go uh, the next thing which you may or may not require most of the microcontrollers do come with uh, onboard flash some of them don't right uh, in my case it was not there so i had to put an external flash and most of the uh, flash uh, ic's uh, operate on quartz pi interface, right? And the connections are quite straightforward. You have four data lines, SD1, 2, 3, and 4, or 0. Um, and then you have chip select and uh, the clock signal. These are uh, similar to what you would find on a SPI bus, right? Um, 
the top part of this uh, circuit is very specific to my uh, use scenario uh, but it, it will not be required in every microcontroller the next thing is micro SD uh, on PX4 we use this to log the data and so it is necessary to have good enough storage space to record all the flight data that you can ever record right um, micro SDs also operate on spy bus right but they can also operate on something called SDIO communication protocol uh, which similar to flash has four data lines but the operation is not exactly same as uh, the flash anyway uh, here I've set it up as a uh, spy uh, interface and generally it is advised to put pull up resistors on all the data lines of the micro SD card so you just put a uh, bunch of 50 uh, somewhere around 50 kilo ohm resistors on there and then connect it to your spy bus of the microcontroller next thing uh, sensors on board right you can have barometer IMU depending on whether you want to run it on spy bus or I square C most of the sensors in today's time have dedicated uh, pins uh, for whatever function um, what I don't have here is uh, some of the accelerometers or IMUs have uh, pins called F-Sync and interrupts. Interrupt you can see here, uh, INT1 and 2. Uh, these things uh, uh, either send the signal out to the microcontroller saying that, hey, we have new data ready, right? Or they, uh, the F-Sync pin sometimes is useful for the microcontroller to th tell the IMU that, please synchronize the uh, recording of the data at this rate, right? Uh, so that allows you to synchronize maybe all the sensors on board uh, and to get uh, better uh, estimation uh, later on. For the UART ports, um, I have personally went with uh, uh, GST connectors because uh, most of the time, uh, at least telemetry is specifically uh, related to radio frequency uh, communication and uh, I'm not an expert on radio frequency so I don't want to put telemetry on board I don't want uh, the communication to be interrupted in any way so it is generally advisable to you know just put a GST GHS connector on there so that you can connect the telemetry and GPS externally rather than having it on board and that's uh, it for the circuit design you can have other small circuit parts uh, like LED or maybe a buzzer on board, uh, maybe a button for boot up or something like that. But those are small things and I would, I would not discuss them a lot here. PCB trace routing is something that is a little bit challenging. Uh, at least uh, for me when I started, it, this was the second PCB that I ever designed in my life. Right, so it's probably not, not very nicely designed PCB. But I have some, uh, some guidelines that I can share with you. Uh, generally, if, so this one is two layer PCB. It has a top layer and the bottom layer. Um, and in this case, what people do generally is your top layer has uh, your signals, basically like whatever the signals coming out from the microcontroller. So all those traces that you see uh, around the microcontroller are the signals and uh, it has the power supply plane the the whole first layer first you set it up as a power supply so 3.3 volt uh, 5 volt and then in between you you set up the communication traces right and the bottom layer of the pcb is generally set up as a ground layer and this is done to reduce the impedance on the trace line so that your communication traces does not get any interference another good guideline is to keep uh, PWM separate and the communication separate. So on the right hand side, I have the PWM ports, right, or the servo outputs that uh, motors or ESCs would need. And on the left hand side, then I have all the communication, which is my sensors and uh, GPS, telemetry, things like that, right? So uh, so it is again the issue of uh, interference. Uh, your Your pulses of the PWM can cause some interference in communication. Um, apart from that, uh, if you have 
a if you are personally going for four layer or six layer pcbs you can make this even more compact even more smaller right because uh, you have much more area to work with to to make your traces and if for those kind of uh, multiple layer pcbs i would heavily recommend you to take a look at st micros uh, an4938 documentation that one does a very good job on explaining what layer should have what kind of signals power ground combination of these whatever it is right and so please take a look at that um, apart from that i think uh, uh, yeah some other important stuff is we discussed the decoupling capacitors so as you can see that you you may see that c8 c9 c4 c5 all around the microcontroller right those are the decoupling capacitors for microcontroller and they are expected to be as close as possible to the microcontroller another thing that should be very close to microcontroller is the clock which is right here it should be as close as possible to the microcontroller so that the clock signal doesn't get any interruptions because that's the driving source for the microcontroller right and so that's uh, some common uh, guidelines and as i said these are guidelines no hard rules so depending on specific situations these can change so the final file flight controller pcb turned out to be something like this right now this is my version 2 for the flight controller pcb which means there is version 1 as well and understand that development is a process right you are going to make failures um, the biggest fa mistake that i made for the version 1 is that i tried to solder everything manually and if you have not tried uh, reflow soldering it is easy if you have right tools but it is very very difficult if you don't have the right tools so so the version 2 is uh, professionally soldered uh, by a company and so I don't have any issues there because for version one, I tried five times and only one time I got successful. So, so if you, yeah, my advice would be if you don't, if you have not done reflux or reflow soldering before, I would suggest take professional help. Spend a little bit more money, but uh, it will turn out, it will, the circuit will turn out to be good, right? Um, so, so we are at the stage where now we have PCB, we have a new microcontroller, we have everything ready. What about the software, right? Even though now we have the PCB, the PX4 still needs to support it, right? And there are a couple of uh, key takeaways. Um, first, you should look at these two folders in the GitHub repository of the PX4 Autopilot. Uh, the top one is the actual, uh, because PX4 runs on the NUTX, which is the RTOS, right? And your microcontroller has to be supported by NUTX. That's the first and most necessary requirement, right? If it is supported by NUTX, then it has to be supported by PX4. What I mean by this is PX4 has something called PX4 base layer. And that's the main core uh, code, which does every low level uh, configuration of the microcontroller and it changes the GPIO functions and everything like that, right? So, so it is important that PX4 supports the microcontroller that you use and that you can find on the, on the folder location given here. So there are three scenarios now. The first one is your microcontroller is supported by both NUTX and PX4. In this case, all you really have to do uh, from the software point of view is change the board files, right? So uh, in the PX4 auto file, autopilot, there is a folder called boards. It defines all the boards. And in there, what you can find is board configuration. It basically defines what pin is doing what, uh, what is your onboard RAM size, whether you have a micro SD or not, uh, whether you have ADC or not, whether which ADC is connected to battery uh, voltage or maybe, you know, uh, battery current. Then you have startup scripts like uh, that will start up Mavlink or onboard sensors, 
right? It will start up different drivers. So all that configuration of both NUTX and PX4 goes into the boards folder. And uh, then if your microcontroller is already supported by PX4, then, you know, it means that some board, some existing board already uses that microcontroller. So that gives you a very nice starting point to just copy that folder of that exact board with the same microcontroller and then start doing changes according to whatever you have designed, right? Uh, but that's a starting point, of course, you know, it will, it will take some time to get everything working, but that's a process. Uh, the next situation, which I did, uh, and I would say that it takes a good amount of time, is your controller is uh, supported by NUTX, but not by PX4. And in this case, you have to do a good amount of coding because you have to develop the whole PX4 base layer for your specific microcontroller, right? Um, some of the starting points is uh, the first folder, uh, that file, PX4, IMPL OS CMake, that one defines uh, where exactly your, uh, how should I say, the PX4 base layer folder located, right? It is generally in uh, platform, not X, source, and uh, then inside there, there are uh, different folders based on every company and the microcontroller. Uh, the second thing is the, the generic ARM non EABI uh, file. That file defines uh, all your compiler flags for your specific microcontroller. Uh, so it may support, uh, you know, a floating point unit and things like that. So you may have to set up different flags for that. Uh, the next thing that you should do is create the PX4 base layer folders and that will that will be the main chunk of your programming development. And the starting point would be, take a look at what other people has already done for you know, every microcontroller, how it was, how the whole thing was implemented. Uh, this uh, GitHub pull request is what I did for the RP2040 microcontroller. And I've tried to uh, push the commits as much as more explanatory as possible so that you know people can have stepwise uh, uh, you know outlook on how the how the whole px4 ba uh, base layer was developed and the third and the most difficult case is your microcontroller is not supported by nutx and it is not supported by px4 and i would say please don't do this it's a, it's a software development nightmare because now we, it's not about hardware development. Now it's much more about software development. Developing NUTX uh, or developing, adding support for NUTX for your specific microcontroller is a good amount of work um, because now you are not dealing with, uh, you know, you are dealing with extremely low level uh, register level programming and everything for the microcontroller and it's too much so I would say avoid this and if you have any questions please ask them I'm happy to answer yes sir um, the okay so for px4 documentation so so there are two parts, right? Uh, in this case, you just have to uh, develop the board files, but in this case, you have to develop the PX4 base layer. PX4 documentation explains, or at least does give you a good starting point for how to develop the board files. It does not tell you anything at all about how to develop the base layer. And, the, the pro and I understand why it is done that way, because PX4 base layer goes a lot deeper into how the microcontroller works. If you have dealt with microcontroller at you know register level, like you are programming each and every register separately and things like that, then you can really understand how to develop the PX4 base layer. So it is difficult, much more difficult than just writing board files. So I understand that why they haven't done it. But yeah, but that was my goal to put that pull request there have the commits so that if someone else is doing it, they can go through all the commits 
uh, and see how the base layer can be developed. Any other question? Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's, uh, try again. Yeah. Okay. Um, memory wise, uh, the H7s, the ESTMs have the flash on board and the most you can get is two megs. So, but by having the, the flash in a separate module, you can fit like 16 megs, you mm -hmm. know, whatever you want. Um, what do you think is the, the way uh, I mean, of course, future proofing is just populating a 16 meg chip, yeah. and that's the way to go. But um, when will uh, the, the PX4, uh, like, let's say, when will we start uh, stop optimizing for space rather than just going for the big flash uh, autopilots? Um, well, no, yeah. because because uh, I mean, there's a tendency to scheme on on. Um, adding new parameters, you know, to, to keep the memory low. And yeah, the, okay, so, so to answer your question, the, your, your question is really, uh, when are we going to have more space just available on flash rather than, you know, doing micro SD or something like that? And no, I mean, uh, we as uh, hardware manufacturers mm -hmm. are limiting somewhat that because we keep doing the same. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that, that point is coming to an end? Or is it going to not take really. much more years? Not really. When, when all the manufacturers have like 16 megs autopilot. You know? Not really. That's what I'm saying. So uh, most of the manufacturers, for example, if you uh, take a look at ST Micro's uh, microcontrollers, right? The onboard flash that those microcontrollers have are generally one meg, two meg, right? And uh, but most of those microcontrollers also support external flash. So if the need arises really to add more flash, you can easily do it. Those micro, so for example, STM32 at seven series does have a uh, QSPY uh, protocol mm. to connect external flash and it can support four gigs of flash. So if, if, the, if the need is really there, then you can always connect it. But as far as uh, PX4 is currently uh, everything is divided into modules and based on your requirement uh, you just activate or deactivate the modules right and so yes you can still optimize for flash and for the most part it it works fine if your flash is smaller than uh, two megabytes it's generally fine uh, some of the uh, some of the um, older microcontrollers even work on uh, one megabyte or even 512 kb of flash yeah, the famous uh, F4s that did just only had one meg, like yeah. eight years yeah. ago. But you can always add the extra. It's it's always possible. Any other questions? No, that's it. Okay, thank you very much for listening to the talk.